Good morning, everybody. We hope you're keeping well, and we just uh, uh, we're missing seeing you all. But hopefully next week, uh, Sunday the thirteenth of December, uh, we'll be back again meeting at our drive-in uh, at the well at eleven thirty, and Stephen Barkley will be our speaker then. Uh, at this service, um, we're hoping to do a wee uh, breaking of bread section. So if you didn't mind bringing some juice and biscuits and we can remember the Lord's Supper and in that way next week. I know we haven't done that uh, at any of our services um, in the drive-in so we just thought this might be a nice idea to do and remember the Lord's Supper in that way. Then on Wednesday the 9th of December uh, we'll be meeting over Zoom for prayer time. Uh, keep an eye on the WhatsApp for the link and we'd love to see more folk uh, logging in for prayer over the uh, WhatsApp, uh, over the Zoom. Uh, then on Sunday the 20th of December in the morning, we'll be having a virtual carol service uh, on YouTube. So this is going to be pre-recorded and it's going to it's going to take place at, uh, on Sunday morning at 11.30. So there'll be no uh, drive-in service that Sunday morning. The reason being is we're going to have an evening service and it's going to be a drive-in carol service in the evening so uh, we would like people to get involved in the virtual carol service in the morning as many people as possible uh, and uh, if you could uh, uh, record yourself doing a, a bible reading or a christmas poem or singing or playing an instrument uh, all would be appreciated and all you need to do is send your wee video to roger johnson and we will have roger make that up um, and we'll, we'll play it on that Sunday morning. If you could get the, the, um, the video sent over to Roger before Wednesday the 16th, Roger would appreciate that. Then the fellowship is providing Christmas hampers this year for some folk in the community that would appreciate it and need it at this time. And if you know anyone who would like a hamper, please let us know as uh, the ladies are getting this uh, stuff gathered together. Um, uh, and that would be on or before Friday the 11th of December um, and if you could get in touch with any of the ladies there the, uh, the uh, donations would be uh, really welcome. Uh, you can either uh, give money towards that, uh, uh, preferably next Sunday uh, if possible, that would be Sunday the 13th in the morning or if you, if you want we can uh, put up the details of the internet banking and you can send a wee uh, we transfer and let us know uh, and we can get that directed towards uh, the hampers um, but uh, God willing uh, that will be well received in the community and as I said before we're missing you all and uh, we just pray that uh, God will bless each of you uh, at home at this time goodbye
Hi guys, we hope you're keeping well and uh, everybody's keeping safe with that. Today what we want to do is to conclude our series on 1 Corinthians 13 about the house that love built. And if you have a Bible with you, we want to go back to that in 1 Corinthians 13. We'll look today at verses 7 and verse 8. But we'll read it anyway, we'll read over this passage again because it's, uh, it's well worth reading. And also it's good to cover ground maybe we've covered before. Here we read 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 1. And though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I become sounding brass or as a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but, that, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, it thinks no evil, it does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And this is what we want to look at today. In verse 7 it says, it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things, and love never fails. And what we've been talking about over the past five weeks now, hard to believe, but what we've been talking about is that God is wanting to build a house. And the reason he's building this house is because he wants to live among us. He wants to dwell by his presence in the midst of his people. But he's made it very clear, the house that he's building is a house of love. He will not live in any other house. God will not live in a house of strife. God will not live in a house of division. God cannot live in a house of judgment. He will not live in that type of place. It would be beneath him to live in such a place. And yet we build our shacks of, of um, strife. We build our little ho uh, hovels of um, hatred. And we say, God, come down among us Sunday by Sunday. And that's typically the picture with many Christians is that they believe that you know God's just gonna cope with it. God's just gonna work with it. But that's not how he works. God is a holy God and he says, be holy as I am holy. He says, I want you to imitate my example. I want you to become more like me. Because you see, godliness attracts God. Love attracts the God of love. And so what you and I have to do, just as out of a hunger for more of his presence, is just say, God, purify my heart. Sanctify my heart. Make it like Jesus. Make me more and more and more like Jesus. And what you will find is you pray that, one of the things God will bring up in your life is love and your capacity to love and your limitations of love. He will bring you to the point where you will say, it is impossible to love that person. And it's in that moment, the Holy Spirit will say to you, would you like me to help you? Holy Spirit will come and fill you if you want to love people. But he will show you your limit. He'll show you that person. He'll show you that circumstance. He will bring you to that straw that will break the camel's back. And he'll say, are you going to give up? Are you going to keep loving? And we have to make that choice with the power of the Holy Spirit behind us. We choose to love people well. And what we've been looking over in these verses in 1 Corinthians 13 are the 15 descriptions that Paul gives to love. Or as I've called them, they're like 15 decisions you and I can make with the power of the Holy Spirit. When you make this decision to be kind or to be patient or, or to rejoice in the truth, whatever that decision is, if you make the decision, the Holy Spirit will back you up. He'll give you the power that you need to do this. And so today, what I want to just encourage you to be is say, Lord, I feel as if I'm at this level of love. I am at this level of capacity in the Holy Spirit's love. Would you take me to the next level? Would you bring me up a gear? Would you bring me up a gear so that I am able to love people as you want me to love them? Because at the end of the day, we all want to be more like Jesus. We all want to be more like him. And Jesus loved people with the power of the Holy Spirit, but he loved people well. One of the loveliest things I think it said about Jesus in John 13, it says he loved his own 
unto the end. That Jesus loved his people. That's what it brings out as, as the final remarks about the life of Jesus. That he loved, he loved, he loved. So if you want to know Jesus, you're going to have to learn to love. If you want to be like Jesus, you're going to have to learn to love. Love is the most important criteria of your life and mine today. But we want to look at these last five descriptions or decisions that you can make about love and they're found in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 7 and 8. And it just says this. It says, love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. And love never fails. Those five things. Now, you think about some of the things we've talked about already in those 15 descriptions or so. You know, we've talked about how love is patient. We've talked about how it's kind. And even last week, what we were talking about is like the internal uh, thinking and feelings of love. You know, it rejoices not in, it thinks no evil, it rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Here is the vision of love that we're going to talk about today in verses 7 and 8. This is the vision, the long-term vision of love. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things, it never fails. And what you find about love is that love has a vision. And the Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. And there's a lot of relationships today that are perishing and dying. There's a lot of divorce out there, even among Christians. There's an awful lot of relationship breakdown in families. There's an awful lot of relationship breakdown in churches and people get split from one another, people divide over things, people leave churches, people do all those sort of things. But the reason for it is we don't have a vision for love. We, we don't have that vision. But verse 7 and verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 13 is that vision that God gives us. He, if you want love to fill you, it will not only fill your heart, it will fill your eyes. You will get a vision of how God wants you to love people. And so often what we do is that we don't have that vision and we sort of just shut our eyes to people, we ignore them, we just say, you're in the dark now, I have, don't want anything to do with you. As to me, you don't exist. You know, that's how, we, that's how we do with things in Northern Ireland. And you know what, it isn't right. It isn't right, you know, although we've got our great doctrine in our Northern Irish churches and we do evangelism pretty well and we give to missionaries and we're very generous and all those good things are in Northern Ireland churches. We are not very good at envisaging love for each other. We, we don't have a long-term plan to deal with people that are difficult. We don't have a long-term plan to cope with people we don't really get on with. You know, it, it is like that. Either you totally ignore them or you just walk away from them. But love is able to be in the thick of it, to know that person, be connected to that person and to love them. And that's what the love of God is able to do. So without any delay, we want to go into these, um, the first ones we read of here in verse 7. The first one we read about is this. It says, love bears all things. Other translations put it like this. The Amplified says this, love bears up all things. The NIV says it always protects, which I think is interesting. J.B. Phillips says, love knows no limit to its endurance. The living, the living Bible talks about love is always making alliances and Moffat says love is slow to expose. This word for love, by the way, is the Greek word stingo, stigo, S-T-E-G-O. And it's a very unusual word. It, it really means two things. It means to persevere with somebody. It means to persevere. So for instance, in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 12, Paul says, we suffer all things, which is the same word, we suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. So Paul said, because I've got a vision for what God wants to do, because of a vision of what God wants to do among a people, he says, I'll suffer it, I'll keep going, I'll keep attacking it, I will keep just pressing into that, I'll keep committed, and I'll do it because I've got a vision. And what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 9 and 12 is that he's got a vision to reach people for Jesus. And as you will well know, trying to win people to Jesus often is about forbearing their bad habits. It's about 
sort of ignoring certain bad things in their life so that you could reach them with the gospel and bring them to the Lord Jesus. That's really what we have to do with many people. But Paul says you need to take that same quality into the church, not just take it outside of the church, bring it into the church, where you're able to patiently endure people's rubbish, essentially. You're able to cope with people. And they may have bad habits, they may have problems, they may have difficulties, but there's an ability from the Holy Spirit for you to endure that and to keep going. Is it nice all of the time? No, it isn't. But you know what? The power of the Holy Spirit will keep you going. But the second reason, the second sort of meaning of that Greek word, uh, stigo, is really interesting. It means to thatch or to cover. Now you think about it there, maybe we don't see it as much now in Ireland, but years back, you know, you didn't have a slate roof, you didn't have, um, you know, a tile roof or corrugated iron on a roof. What you had was like brick walls and then you had a thatch. You had a thatch. We have a picture in our house, of my mum and dad's house, of, the, of our house, what it was maybe hundreds of years back, and it was a, a, it was a stone building and there was a thatch on it. And every year, somebody would have to come as a thatcher and begin to you know, replenish that roof. And if you didn't, all the bad stuff of the day got into it. And that word here that we're talking about, Paul says, love is like a roof over other people. Love provides a covering. The NIV talks about love protects people. And you might say, what's this all about, Stephen? It's about protecting other people's reputation from criticism. Do you know what often happens when you and I get hurt by people? Half the country finds out about it. We will tell so-and-so, this pastor did this to me and this elder did this to me. And did you hear what she said? And did you hear what he said? Did you hear what they did? Did you hear what other did? And you pick up the phone and you're ringing your friends and you get on WhatsApp and you spread a message or two. Please pray for me because so-and-so did this to me and that. And that's the way we treat each other. We, we're gossipers. We're critics. We're slanderers. And you know what we're doing? Whenever you do that, you have ripped the thatch off the roof. You've exposed the people that are in that house. And all of the rain and all of the storm and all the wind is battering them and hitting them. Do you realize love puts a roof over people's heads? That's what love always does. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, Above all, keep fervent love for one another. Because love covers, it, it, it acts like a roof, it covers a multitude of sins. Now, is this making an alliance to say what they did to you was okay? Not at all. We have to say that was wrong, but we have to forgive. But how we protect that person's reputation, that's really what you have to do here. What you see, forgiveness is where you're saying, God, if I hold on to this unforgiveness in my heart, I'm sinning against God. But what we're doing here is about loving people where we protect their reputation so that it doesn't get worse. So for instance, in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 5, Paul says a little leaven. So imagine you got your, 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 you're baking some bread or you're doing something like that there and you put a little, little, little bit of leaven into that, a little bit of yeast into that bit of dough. It will fill and permeate the whole of that dough that when you put it in the oven, it will fill up. You see, that's what rumors do. That's what gossip does. That's what, that's what happens when you and I are not acting as that roof to cover people's mistakes, their faults, and their failures. We are not acting as that covering that God would want us to be. And as a result of it, there's exposure. There's exposure of people's faults. There's exposure of the things that people do. That we're broadcasting other people's mistakes, which you should never do. Because I'll ask you this question. How would you like it if somebody could broadcast everything you have ever done wrong? How would you like it if somebody got up on the six o'clock news and said, I'm going to tell you about John Smith. I'm going to tell you about everybody in this family. I'm going to tell you. And you would say, I'd be mortified if it was me. And yet how easy it is to go and talk about other people's faults to people that have nothing to do with them. I mean, that's not a right thing to do at all, is it? John Wesley said this, 
Whatever evil the lover of mankind says, hears or knows of anyone, he mentions it to none. It never goes out of his lips unless for absolutely duty constrains him to speak. That other words that if you have a choice to talk about someone's bad points, you don't do it. You don't do it. But you hold it in. You hold it in. You don't talk about it. That's none of their business. Why would you want to go and talk? You see, the reason why we talk about other people's faults all of the time is because we don't talk to God about it. And if you're leaving the presence of God to talk to another person about another person's faults, you have not got through to God. You have not got through to God. I can think of countless times where I have just seen people's bad behavior, even towards myself. And I've had to go to the presence of God and I've stayed in the presence of God until I've got my roof over that person's life maintained and I can say before God, God, I don't need to talk about that person's faults ever again. I don't need to do that. Now, as John Wesley said there, unless you're absolutely duty bound to do so. So, for instance, if you know about a crime, you have to tell the relevant authorities. If you know that there is some abuse taking place, you need to go and tell those people. But love, when it comes to the sort of itsy bitsy, insignificant, sort of run of the mill stuff, you keep that roof on. You keep protecting the well being. And you keep protecting the dignity and the reputation of that other believer. One of the things I love so much is about King David. You read about twice, the Bible says about King David that he and King Saul, there was a massive falling out. And, and the Bible says that Saul pursued David like a dog. He wanted to kill him. And on two occasions, the Bible says that, that David caught Saul and could have killed him. He could have drew the sword and could have killed Saul. And we read about one instance where he nearly got him when Saul was asleep. And what David was about to kill him, and as the Bible says the Lord pricked his heart. God says, you can't do that. And he cut a bit of, of Saul's garment, and he ran to the other hill opposite where Saul was. And he shouted at Saul, and he says, I could have got you today, but I didn't. You know, today the comparison is not drawing your sword, it's drawing your tongue. And your tongue is like a sword. You can either use that as a powerful weapon of prayer and worship and transformation, or you can use it to criticize, to judge, to slander, or to gossip people. You have to do what God did with David. You have to put the sword back in its sheath, and you have to say, I have bridled it. I have not brought this thing out. So it says, love is able to, in, uh, to bear all things. It bears with people's faults. You might say, well, look, are we just going to have to sit with people that have all these problems and all these bad things in their lives and just sort of accept it and make alliances, even as you quoted uh, from one uh, translation? No, because when you bear with somebody, if you bear with them and you sort of I'm hanging on for you, I'm just covering your reputation, I'm going to look after you, you're starting a journey with that person of transformation. And the next step that we read of is this, is that love believes all things. Another translation, the Amplified, says this, love is ever ready to believe the best of every person. I want you to think about this. One of the titles we give to Jesus is the Redeemer. And what we mean by Redeemer is, is that, you know, you can purchase back something that's valuable. Do you know, in every one of us, as I was talking about maybe at the start of this series, every one of us has garbage and every one has gold. Why focus on the garbage when there's gold in every one of our lives? And what we have to do when we bear with someone, we're bearing with the garbage. But when we're believing in someone, we're believing in the gold. And this word for believe is, is the same word in the Bible used for faith. It's the same word to, you know, to believe in Jesus or to believe. It's that you see the best in that person. I mean, you see the best in that person and you hold on to that person's best and you say, I believe that that is there in that person. It's like when you believe in Jesus, you believe who he is in his best of best of best descriptions. I mean, when any one of us believes in Jesus at conversion, we don't know everything there is to know about Jesus. We don't know every Bible verse. We don't know every um, thing that there is to know about Jesus, but we've seen enough to believe that he's trustworthy, to believe that he's worthy of our trust, that that's what we do. And we have to put faith in people. 
We believe in the best of people. It's interesting to think about it as I wrote this thing down here today. Love is not cynical. It does not revert to the worst in a person. It isn't super suspicious of a person's behavior. It isn't behaving like that. It doesn't always sort of dragging them over hot coals. It, always, it isn't putting them on a hook uh, to see them you know, hang there and to just be eventually find out to be something they're not. It says love believes all things. It believes the best in people. I want to ask you today, are you a cynical person? Are you a person that's continually looking at the worst or looking or searching or probing in for the worst about a person? We find in the days of uh, King David, I, I think it's uh, when he, after he became king, it says that he went to make a peace offering or an offering of uh, generosity towards the king of Tyre, who he had been very friendly with his father. And the Bible says that some of the counsellors among, among, among that young king said, David is trying to, to usurp your throne. David's trying to do this. So what David was doing, he was trying to be kind to this king, Tyre. But what happened was he, he listened to these cynical, suspicious, judgmental people around him. And he started to believe the worst in David's actions. He started to believe the very, 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 very worst in people. And we have to say, look, I am shutting down that voice. I am not being an unbelieving person. I'm going to believe in the best in people. I'm going to believe in that because you know what? Often the best of a person is how God sees them. And as you pray into that, as you, you hold on to that and say, Lord, I see the gold in them. I see the gold. Lord, bring out the gold in that person. You will find in process of time, the gold will come to the surface. The gold will replace the garbage if you will not give up in faith. The problem is we give up too soon. We write them off. We say they're no good. We say we don't believe in them. We say that you're, no, you're, you're not anything to me. And that's never good. You know, there's other people you know as well. And they'll say something to you like this. That, you know, there's no good in that person. How could you ever see good in that person? Well, this is where we need to turn to God. We may not see the best in that person. But God has a best for that person. The Bible says, for instance, about Jesus in Isaiah 11 and verse 3. This is amazing about Jesus. It says he would never judge according to his ears or according to his eyes. So Jesus never judged on outward appearances. Jesus never looked at somebody and said, you know what, not worth it. Because think of it, if Jesus judged people by outward appearances... He would have picked Pharisees as his disciples and not tax collectors, fishermen and zealots. If Jesus judged people according to what he could see and hear, he would have walked past the case and says, you're crooked. He would have said to blind Bartimaeus, would you, would you please shut up? You're too noisy. He would have said to the lepers, oh, you're looking awful. You're awful disgusting. You know, if Jesus judged things according to his eyes or his ears, he would have never, ever, ever been Jesus. Because Jesus did not judge, the Bible says, according to his eyes or his, but according to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit showed him the gold in lives of garbage. Can you be thankful today that God saw the gold in you even before he saved you? I mean, I'm not saying that there was anything redeemable in you, but I mean this, that God saw what you could be. If he saved you, he saw the other side of conversion. He saw what the blood of Jesus could do in your life. And he did not give up on you. So then why, after you receiving such favor from God, would turn around and say to other people, you know what, I, I'm not going to bother. God's good to me, but I don't really want to show that same thing to you. Jesus did not judge according to what he saw naturally, but what he saw supernaturally. And sometimes what, you'll sh what God will show you about a person is that there's something that he wants to do in their lives. I love the story that uh, Tom Hamlin, I, I've mentioned him before, ha has, has shared in his own life, in his own testimony. Before he came to God, before he came to Jesus, he was an angry young man, a really, really, really angry young man. And he was angry with the world, he was angry with his dad, he even beat his dad up, and, and, and there was all these, all these awful things. But one day in an open air, there was a Baptist man preaching in the streets. And God spoke to this Baptist man and he saw Tom in the streets. And God spoke to him and said, 
Pursue that young man until you get him. And what that Baptist man did was that he took that sort of sort of vagabond young man, that angry young man, and brought him into his home. And his wife and himself, they, they became like second parents to him. They loved him and they loved him and they loved him. Because they could see past the outward appearance. Remember, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God can see what a person can become. And what you and I have to do is begin to say, like Jesus did, Lord, show me the best of what that person can be. Think of it like this. Let's say you've got your rogues gallery. You've got the one and they're a drug addict. You've got another and they're an alcoholic. You've got another one and they're a crooked businessman. And we would say, that one's this and that one's that and that's the other. And we would write each one of them off. And you bring God into that same rogues lineup. He would look at the alcoholic and say, they're going to be an artist and a musician. He would look at the drug addict and say, they are going to be a loving housewife and a good mother. And he would look at the crooked businessman and say, I am going to make that person a missionary. You see, if you judge it according to what you see, you have no faith. Faith sees the invisible. And that's what it means, that love believes all things. It sees the invisible worth of a person that looks worthless. It sees the invisible beauty in the ugliness. And you have to say, God, open my eyes to see what you need me to see. Take it, remember, you know, when, when I was younger, I could still remember this. I know I'm, I'm not quite, you know, over this yet. But when I was younger, I remember that you used to get photos in the, in the, in the um, pol Polaroids. And what you got were the negatives. You got the negatives and what you had to do was you had to go down uh, to the chemist. And they would take the negatives and they would do all the various chemical works with them. And they would come back to you in a number of days in beautiful technicolor. Can I tell you this, right? In your life, you are being fed negative pictures of people all of the time. God has appointed you to be a chemist that brings his beauty, his technicolor, his full expression into those pictures. And you see people in an entirely different way. That's what you are to do with the love of God. You are to believe all things. To believe the best in a person but to believe God's best in that person's life. The Bible says the way that we enter into that is Philippians 1 and 9. Paul says, I pray for you that your love would abound more and more with knowledge, which means revelation from Holy Spirit, but also discernment. So don't ever think that love is gullible. It's not. It looks at the negative photo, but says that can become a positive photo. It looks at the, all that negative photo that's all, you know, brown and black and you can't make it out and it just, you throw it in the bin. But, but it's patient, it believes, and it says that is going to become a beautiful picture in time. So love, it bears all things, it believes all things, but then it says it hopes all things. If you look here at, at, at verse 7, it says love hopes all things. Other translations of this go like this. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, the Amplified Bible says. And the uh, International Standard Version says this. There is no limit to its hope. It's all well and good believing something about someone. It's all believing the best. But, but what about hoping? What about holding on in expectation? Because anytime you read the word hope in the Bible, re replace it with expectation. That we don't just merely believe, oh yeah, God could make that person beautiful, you know, and God could do it. But we honestly expect it to happen. We honestly expect it to happen. We don't just sit here with our, you know, sitting on our hands just saying, oh well, if it happens, it happens. If God's will is in it, I suppose, you know. And we sort of, you know, behave like that. But expectancy fills our hearts. That we say it may, it's just not that it may happen, it will happen. There will come a transformation in that person's life. I think about it so many times. I have seen this in relationship where you are tempted to walk away from somebody. You're tempted to disconnect from somebody. And what you have to do is to say, Lord, look, wait a minute. I'm going to bear with that person. I'm going to believe for God's best in that person. And I am going to hope. I'm going to pray with expectancy that that person is going to be changed. It is the belief and confidence 
that others will be touched by God's power. Do you know what? The church of Jesus is to be a community of people who are constantly being transformed. I mean, that's one of the things we should be praying for is God, transform all of us to take us to places and experiences with you we've never been in before. Take us and make us like Christians we've never been like before. I mean, God's able to do that with any one of us. And that's what churches should be like. That Let's say if you went to a church last year and you know you don't go back for another year if you did that test you should see a noticeable visible change in every single person that goes to that church within that one year there should be visible signs of transformation there ought to be that because houses of hope need to be raised up where anybody can be transformed I'm not just talking about you know people that are the worst of the worst so called I mean about you can I ask you a question personally in the past year or so, can you notice things that God has changed in your life? Can you notice, can you tell me maybe maybe three things? Give me three things. Maybe write that down as you're at home here today. Write down three things that God has transformed in your character in the past year. Tell me about things that God has been working in you. Because the Bible says God is working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's not about saying, oh, well, you know, there's um, so-and-so is going to, you know, come along and I've got a house extension and, and this person got a new car. I'm not talking about events around you. I'm talking about what's God done inside of you. Because transformation should be normal. We should have hope and expectation and confidence this is going to happen. Let's look at this other one as we conclude. It says, love endures all things. So love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. But it says, love bears all things. Other translation says, Amplified says, endures all things without wavering. It says NIV, always perseveres. NLT says, endures through every circumstance. And Philip says, it can outlast anything. The word in the Greek is hubomeno, which means to under remain. It means to remain under. It was originally a military word. It was used for soldiers who could hold on to a territory and not give up. Love holds the ground. Love stays with a person and says, I am sticking with you until God changes you. I am staying the course with you until God radically changes your life. I love the story they told about David Wilkerson who was in New York City. He was only 26 or 27 years of age and he had been fasting and praying for many, many years unsettled by God's Holy Spirit. And he picked up a book of Life magazine and he saw all these young men from uh, gangs in New York City standing trial. And one of them was Nicky Cruz, who was the leader of all those various uh, sort of groups. And God spoke to David Wilkerson and says, go to New York. And he went down there. He was, a, he was just a country pastor. He went into the big bad city of New York and he was sleeping in his car every night and he was going out the streets prayer walking and he was witnessing to these gang members and he spoke to Nicky Cruz and he kept telling him about, about the love of Jesus, kept telling him about the love of Jesus and and it's the, it's the story, the cross and the switchblade. But Nicky Cruz did not want to hear what Dave Wilkerson had to say. And in actual fact, one day, Nicky Cruz was so tired of Nichols, uh, Wilkerson, but rather, hanging around all the time. He's telling him about Jesus. He says, I'm going to cut you up to ribbons. I'm going to cut you up into a thousand pieces. And David Wilkerson replied, if you cut me up into a thousand pieces, every piece of me will tell you Jesus loves you. Every part of me will tell you that Jesus loves you. And Nicky Cruz's heart was just so, so pierced, so convicted by those words. And that was one of the instrumental moments that brought him to Jesus. And he goes around the world testifying now to the power of God and how God can save anybody. But you see, friends, love knows how to, to outlove the offense. Love knows how to play the long game. Do you know what? Radical transformation doesn't always take place overnight doesn't always take place in a matter of moments sometimes it can take weeks sometimes it can take months but if God has spoken to you and you believe what God has told you the best about that person you expect God to move you will hold on not because you're needy or because you've got an emotional baggage in your life 
but because you really believe God's going to change that person and that relationship's going to get so much better. It, it's interesting, as I thought about it today, it journeys with people. Love has the ability to journey with people. And you know what? If you meet anybody, whether they're a Christian or not a Christian, they're not where God would like them to be. They're not where God would like them to be. But we have to learn to journey with people to bring them to where God wants them to be. We have to learn how to do that. We need to hold on until transformation happens. And the final thing we read about here in verse 8, it says, love never fails. Do you know what? That's, that's a lovely description just to end that 15 long uh, description of love. Love never fails. It, it, it never, ever fails. It, it doesn't drift off. It doesn't disappoint. It doesn't fail in the face of a challenge. Love wears the victor's crown. And we all love those stories of triumph. We all love those stories of breakthrough. But you know what? Before you can say love never fails, you have to go through the first 14. You have to be able to be patient and kind and not envy and not boast and not be puffed up and to rejoice not in iniquity, not to rejoice in people's failures, but you rejoice in the truth. You bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things, and then love never fails. But you know what? If you're willing to hold on tight, if you're willing to keep your love burning and keep your love going, you will see transformation happen in your life and in the lives of other people. You know, God is looking not only to build a house of love, but a house of transformation. When, when we build that house of love and the presence of God comes, you can bring anybody into that house. I long for the days where, where churches are not filled with churchgoers. They are filled with desperate people looking for help. And as they come into the house of the Lord, they find the presence of Jesus is there and they find loving Christians who believe for transformation. Because friends, we need that. We need that so badly. Because there's so many people out there today and they don't go to church and they don't feel part of church. And what they're desperately needing is the power of God. They need to encounter the Lord. But it's the loving gatekeepers that will open the door for them. So this is the end of our series. It's, it's a series that we could probably do better justice to. There's so much more you could probably say. But you know what? I could give you all the explanations you could ever want. I could give you illustration after illustration after illustration. But you know what the best thing to do is obedience. Just to say, Lord, as much as I understand, I want to apply that in my life. I want to obey you. And as you obey the Lord, even if it's a baby step of obedience, the Bible says God writes that down in heaven in a book of remembrance for those who fear his name. And he trusts you with more of the Holy Spirit. God wants you to obey his voice. Just obey whatever God is putting on your heart right now, as you've heard the truth being shared with us today. Just apply that into your heart. Get alone with God. Even take five or ten minutes. Just get alone with God and say, God, I just feel I need to work on this in my life. I really need to work on this. And I'm not just praying that to, you know, to say, oh, well, it, it might work. Just say, God, you're going to work and you're going to transform me. Because he will. So this is the house that love built and God is building his house today so let's pray a little minute father we thank you so much that you are a loving God and you empower us to love other people and father I pray for every person today that you're speaking to that the Holy Spirit would father God work in their lives and cause them to love as you would love them we pray Lord God enlarge our hearts Enlarge our capacity for the Holy Spirit. Lord, strengthen our willingness, we pray, and cause us to love and love and love and never give in or give up. So, Father, we bless your name. We thank you that you're building your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In Jesus' name, amen. So God bless you. Hopefully we'll be able to see you in person next week and we'll be able to fellowship with one another again. But may God bless you, bless your families, and hopefully we'll catch up soon. See you soon.